Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for attending the event today. I also want to thank um, Alex for joining us. We've been planning to have him as a speaker at some Brazil Gateway event for a long time, so I'm really happy it worked out today. So um, I'm Jane, I'm the director of the Ohio State University office in Brazil, the Brazil Gateway. I was also a student at Ohio State in 2015. I did my uh, master's in international law uh, at the Morris College of Law. Uh, I just wanted to quickly tell you what we do here at the office in Brazil. So just in case you need any of our services, you know where and who to reach out to. So um, the Brazil Gateway, along with the China Gateway and the India Gateway, work uh, to support and connect Ohio State University within these um, important countries. So we work in four areas. The first one is the students. We help Ohio State students come to Brazil, for example, for internships, for um, cultural programs, for um, research. But we, we also help Brazilians go to Ohio State for their degrees and uh, for research as well. So if you know anyone interested, let us know. Uh, the second area is faculty and research. So we do connect Ohio State faculty members with Brazilian um, faculty members within many different um, institutions here in Brazil, in many different states, so they can do research together, publish together, and um, host events together. The third area is partnerships. So we try to keep um, Ohio State connected, not only to universities, but also to companies, nonprofits, and um, government offices. So, um, they can collaborate on sponsored research, uh, put together executive education programs, offer internships for Ohio State students and things like that. And then finally, our last um, area of focus is alumni. So we try to keep the alumni, uh, the Brazilian alumni connected and helping each other and participating in events such as this. Alex will explain that he is um, an alum from Ohio State, and it's wonderful to have um, alumni engaging with current students, faculty, and staff. So this is something we always try to, to do. That's it. I will share here in the chat our social media so you can have updated information on these areas of work, and you can also reach out if you want to. Thank you so Thanks. much, Caitlin. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Uh, so now I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening. Alex is the founder of Intertech Rail, a company specializing in railroad technology with offices in Coral Gables, Florida, and operations and manufacturing facilities in several countries. He has worked extensively in matters involving rail technology, logistics, and international trade with developing countries. He earned his bachelor's degree in electronics engineering from University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, his MBA in international business from FGV in Brazil, and his master's in business logistics engineering from the Fisher College of Business at Ohio State. Um, so now I will turn the floor over to you, Alex, for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Keith Lint. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, invite me for for this presentation. I'm really proud to come back to Ohio State in some way. You know, uh, I remember my time in 2009 when I finished my master in business logistics engineering at Ohio State, and uh, and I remember these days. I mean, they were so nice to be there, and I learned so much. Um, so just to complement, uh, I've been working in rail market for a while, for almost like uh, maybe 20 years. Um, I started, when I graduated in engineering, I started to work with uh, automation, actually industrial automation. And then after that, I just worked with uh, uh, industrial companies. 
Uh, after that, I started to focus more on uh, railroads. And then after that, I mean, even so, I mean, started to work with railroads, all type of a technology for railroads. And I got so amazed about the technology that we have in this type of market. And normally, we don't see actually as a user when you go to a, let's say a rail station you just see the train you just see the station you go inside the train you step off in your in your station and that's it but there are so many things that happen behind the scenes that you don't see uh so many things and the technology is one of the most amazing parts at least for me that I uh, so that's why I got uh, got hooked by this technology by the market and I never I never left probably I will never left this market anymore. <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk about this uh, the technology for railroads and also what do you have in terms of safety and how important is safety and sustainability in in railroads. So. Um, Okay, to go to the, okay, there you go. Uh, just a little history in terms of railroads. Um, railroads have been around since, let's say, uh, 1800s. So we started here in the United States with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1830, it finished by 1850. After that came the Boston Railroad and then South Carolina Railroad. Uh, the railroads, they were not only uh, responsible actually to transport goods and uh, more efficiently. Actually, that's why that's that's what happened that time. Much much better than uh, uh, let's say by boat that they used to do or using animals. Um, they uh, it also contributed to the development of other industry where the railroad was located. So it helped actually to the that was not only helpful but also uh that was a trigger for the economy growth especially on that time even today it's a good thermometer for the economy growth uh as as uh caitlin mentioned before we as intertech rail we've been working especially with uh with um in, um, in developing countries so there's a friend of mine that told me that. I mean, if you want to know if the economy, especially in these developing countries, are doing well or growing, you just check how many rail cars they are buying. If they're, they're, buying, they're buying more, it means that they are growing. If they're not buying rail cars, it means uh, there is something there. So we start to use this thermometer on this, on this, this market. And then that's pretty uh, interesting because it works even today uh what is the what is actually the rail the railway system market we are talking about here and not actually about the railroad itself it's not about transportation i mean i mean we're going to talk about railroads we're talking about transportation itself the the revenue of transportation you're talking about let's say uh uh the cost or the revenue actually to build let's say rail yards or the cost to build new railroads you're talking about here just the technology market just the system market railway system market is a specific market inside a railroad railway market so just that technology market inside the railroad it's valued to in 2018 by 25 billion dollars worldwide uh and we project it to be almost like a 40 billion by 2026 so it's a market that not everybody know much about it's not a, actually a huge market but there is still a lot of money that goes into that and you see in the type of a technology that you see in this type of railroads and that's why we've been working <laughs> with them so much um of course, European, Europe accounted for the highest share in the global rail, railway system market in 2008. Uh, after that, Asian Pacific. So it means that most of the developing countries actually are the ones that most invest today actually in system and railway system market, actually in the in railway systems, in railway technology. So these numbers, of course, do not include 
Rail transportation and does not include infrastructure like a rail turnouts, rail yards, mainline constructions, and etc. So when you add that, the number is going to be way different. But uh, again, let's focus here on on technology that probably most of the people here want to to hear more about. Uh, if you split that the technology in railway or the railway system market in different rolling stock types. So when you talk about rolling stock is everything that moves on the top of a rail track. So everything that moves, we call it rolling stock. So as you can see that everything is focused actually here on freight cars, actually on rail cars, on freight rail cars, and of course, passenger rail cars. So again, remember that I mentioned before about the thermometer that you use to try to identify if the economy is growing up. It means like, okay, oh, we measure uh, how many rail cars they're buying now. Of course, it's not a direct, it's not that, let's say, uh, clear, but we can get at least an idea if it's growing or not. So as you can see here, most of the investments goes to the freight rail cars and actually to passenger, passenger coaches. Uh, when I talk about rail, we most of the people, they think, oh, I, I take the subway every day to go to work. Oh, I take the commuter train every day to work. But there, the, the, in, when you talk about the infrastructure for the railroad, you're talking about a universe way more than that. You're talking about freight trains, light rails, talk about subways, rail yards, uh, rack trains, bullet trains, commuter rail. So there are lots of things. And, for each one of those, we have a different technology, and then we have a different approach. Uh, the mo one of the most important points, and actually one of the points that is congruent for all of them, especially for railroads, is safety. So there are lots of technology in here, lots of things. The same, the same type of technology that sometimes you see in airplanes or even in cars, but Together with the uh, with the airplane market, uh, railroads they are really focused on safety. So, uh, as you can see, the train safety is still projected to be the most lucrative segment until two thousand twenty six, and uh, we have all type of of course technology like a train safety train information onboard vehicle control propulsion uh let's say uh systems to show where the train is located and etc but it's still the train safety is still one of the most demanded and the most requested technologies for railroads uh let's talk about safe secure and efficient transport system Okay, let's talk about a little bit about, uh, more about that. Uh, when you talk about transportation systems, especially for passengers and uh, even for cargo, uh, and we compare that to road traffic, you see the injuries, you see the accidents that happen on that. Is this still on the, one of the most, uh, the, one of the, actually that's the limit cause of fatality among people. Um, and um, and uh, especially on uh, in developing countries, it represents a great part of their GDP. What is the problem, actually? So uh, it could, can cost, for example, for most countries, as, as I can see there, is actually 3% of their GDP. It's a lot. Uh, when you talk about Transport safety, railroads actually really, I mean, it's on the, if you see this graph upside down, it's like a, one of the most safer, the, the, the safest transportation is actually airplanes. And then after that is trains. And then you see buses and then you see cars. Um, that's why uh, still most of the public opinion is still looking for safety and is still looking for ways of transportation that you can, that, that does not affect so much their GDP. In terms of size, just to have an example, uh, the United States has the largest railroad network in the, in the globe. 
Somebody's going to think about Europe. Europe is close. It's 216,000 kilometers. So, but that's the whole Europe. It's not just one country. If you separate by the country, you see China after that, and then Russia, India, Canada, Germany. Uh, I put Canada here, but actually when you talk about railroads here in North America, you can, I can say that it's all connected North America, like Mexico, United States, and Canada. If you put them together, you see that that's one of, that's, that's actually the largest railroad uh, network in the globe. Um, it's different than Europe. In Europe, you have lots of railroads, but in a in small, it, it's located, it's all concentrated and actually in a small piece, let's say, of land. Here in the United States, actually in North America, we have a, lots of land. And that's why, that's why in order to cover that, that's that we have to, to use actually several lines of railroads in order to cover that and to be able to transport. Just to have an idea, that's here in the United States. You see Union Pacific, you see Norfolk or Southern, you see CSX, you see BNSF and then Trek. Uh, all of them, they cover a huge part of the United States. Some parts actually with more populated areas with more railroads and not so much populated areas with uh, not so many, let's say, rail tracks. Just to give an idea. So uh, technology is required not only to improve safety, but also to improve um, uh, performance of these railroads. So, but you cannot improve performance without safety. And that's one of the key things about railroads. So uh, just let me talk about a little basic thing about railroads. Uh, in railroad, we say that safe is not enough. We always say that it's safe is not enough. It must be fail safe. So let's change a little bit to an engineering language here. So what is fail safe? Say fail, fail safe, fail safe for us is uh, the system may fail. Any system may fail. Anything. The the in an airplane, for example, um, a turbine may get on fire the a simple thing like a semaphore uh the lights that you have to cross when you cross the street with your car uh it may fail the problem is if it fails it has to assume a safe state it means the red light or the the, the lights that in the, the crossroad plus close uh, close to our house may never get or turn on green just because it fails. It can never happen. So we have to find some way, especially in technology, to if it fails, it fails in a position that is safe for everyone. And that's key for, for in, in, in railroads. All the systems that you see in railroads, they follow the same structure. It must fa be fail safe. It must survive all the, the, the environment. It must, uh, everything real world is so complex and so, so big. For example, if you install, for example, a rail uh, tag, let's say we install a tag in a rail car, you probably won't see the car anymore. You'll probably be able to identify that tag, but if it fails, probably won't be able to bring that car back. So if it fails, you need to know that it failed. So let's go to a basic thing. In uh, 1869, a um, uh, famous guy called uh, George Westinghouse. He created a um, mechanical brake for, rail, for, for a train. It means basically, uh, in a simple way to explain that is, let's pick a train, let's say 10 cars. All of these 10 cars are connected by a pipe. It's called a brake pipe or the train line. This brake pipe, uh, you put actually pressure inside there. This pressure, instead of activating the, the brakes, it deactivates the brakes. So we have a kind of a structure, as you can see here, I don't wanna go into details, but basically you, uh, the system with pressure deactivates the brake. If something happened happen with the system, let's say the, the pipe breaks, or if something, let's say that the train derails, the, 
the pipe actually open up, the air is gone, so there is no more pressure. And then automatically the brake is applied. So that's when that's why, for example, it happens. For example, you have a tank cars, and then for some reason, one of the car, the last car separated from the main train. So this car that was separated from the main train actually disconnected, is disconnected from the train line, and then it stops in the middle of the rail track. It, it does not continue to roll because that's a safety issue for us. And everything in railroad is like that. Another example. So again, if it fails, it must assume the safest position. Again, level crossing system. It's pretty common to see those. Uh, I remember to see lots of those in, in Columbus, Ohio too. Um, close by to Ohio State. Uh, the, and that's one of the type of the system that we work with. We just implemented one here now in, in Colombia, um, a few, uh, that was a few maybe days ago. So that was last month maybe, yeah, that we just delivered the, la the one of our level crossing systems. Um, basically, looks simple, right? You have a, just some lights, we have a, a gate, we have uh, basically a simple system that opens and then the train is approaching. So we have something that detects the train and then closes the gate. So basically we do not close the gate. We keep the gate open. So it means the system keeps the gate open all the time. If it fails, it closes the gate. If it detects a train, it, 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 it uh, closes the gate. If it fails to detect anything, it closes the gate. If somebody goes there and steal, let's say the, let's say the, the train detector or something like that, it closes the gate too. So it means what you would like to say is we do not close the gates, the gravity does. So the system is an electrical mechanical system that if in case of fail, it assumes the safest position and the safest position actually is closed. Okay, oh, we're gonna stop the traffic. That's okay. It's, that's the safest position. It's better to be closed than to be open for some, let's say, error in the system and the train passes and hits someone. Um, we still see accidents, of course, because we still have the, the human, uh, human variable on that. So when the gate is closing, there are people trying to go around that and et cetera. And of course, there's all types of a possible failures that may happen. But it's still the system, for example, if somebody crashes and uh, break the two gates, if it closes, no, it's not gonna close anything because there's no gate anymore. So there is still possibility for, for um, for accidents, but it's still the system is the, the, the goal of the system is to, if it fails, go to a safe position when possible. Um, when you talk about train detection, when you're talking about train detection in the level crossing, uh, we basically, that's one of the basic things too. We put actually a voltage in the rail track in the rail track, we get, we have in an, uh, one side we have a, a, a power supply, and in the other side we have a relay that is activated by this voltage. If something happens to this power supply, if something happens to the relay, or if a train goes over that, that creates a short circuit in the circuit. Basically, it's gonna occup occupy the circuit. It means like uh, the train is going to be in the detected by our system. So if something happens or if the train is there, it's going to be detected. And once detected, we de-energize the uh, level crossing and then it's going to close. So these are really basic things and means like uh, how, what is that, uh, what type of systems normally we see in railroads. Of course, these basic things, they are the basic of most of the systems and uh, but there are high-end, uh, let's say, technology 
in, in railroads. And I can show you later with a, one of the videos that I have here, you, you, you can understand what type of, uh, let's say, uh, um, technology that you see now today. Uh, this, for example, is a fail-safe relay. The fail-safe relay, it's like a regular relay, but basically when uh, it's connected, it's gonna assume some position. If for some reason it fails, the gravity moves all contacts to a safer position. So I know exactly that is that we had a failure or something like this, okay? And can safe be green? Can, can, can what type of, uh, let's say, uh, sustainability we have on these type of systems? Um, in terms of sustainability, we have uh, most of these equipment, especially how we, the way that we build these relays, the way that we build the level crossings, most of them, they use specific materials. Most of them, they're hard to manage. They're pretty expensive. For example, we cannot, in relays, for example, we cannot use just metal because they got a magnet, uh, they can get, uh, they can become like a magnet. So we have to use different type of metal that's called uh, silicone steel. Silicone steel is, even if you magnetize that, it doesn't get magnet. So it's, it's, the application is specifically for fail safe uh, for fail safe arrays, and uh, but but this type of material is hard to manage and hard to buy, and uh, they're pretty expensive. So basically, today we recycle those materials. We go to the rail yards, we get those old relays, we remove, of course, just the material, and we can recycle those materials, we use them to build new relays. Same for level crossings. Uh, it's pretty common also to have uh, platforms that you put in between the, the rail tracks in order to make it a smooth transition from road to rail and then rail to road. Like uh, your car go over a rail track. You cannot just go over a rail track. You can get trapped in there. So we, we have platforms that you install on that. These platforms today, it's made of uh, recycled materials like uh, uh, it's made of rubber, but it, you can use, for example, old tires to make that. So there's lots of options, especially to be sustainable in this type of market. Is still and actually uh, maintaining the safety um, characteristics of, of the, the technology. Um, our, oh. Somebody asked me too, some time ago, about the COVID and the COVID impact and uh, how railroads we would, uh, let's say, um, work with, uh, with, with this impact. Um, especially for us, for example, we, and how it would actually, um, let's say, improve or affect the safety of the railroads with this COVID-19. Because today, for example, most of those railroads, I mean, not talking about freight railroads now, but it's specifically about, let's say, subways or commuter rails. We have, uh, we still have the railroads, we still have people that want to use them, but you have these distance restrict, uh, restrict um, restrictments. We have, uh, you cannot be so close apart with other people. So how to improve the safety, the safety also on this part. Um, different than freight railroads, they are not, so, they are, rail, uh, freight railroads, they are not so affected by that. One important thing about railroads is uh, most of the investments, they are not actually I mean, I've never heard, never seen that investments for two years in a railroad yard or, oh, I'm going to, going to invest or to build a new railroad yard. And after two years, oh, I decided not to use that anymore. No, normally the investments for railroad, they're thinking about at least 40, 50, 60 years, sometimes even 100 years. Um, so things like a pandemic, of course, might happen even over. 50 years, 100 years. So they expect that. So um, 
uh, freight railroads, they're, let's say, they're used to this type of, even though they see a decline, of course, in some kind of transportation or, or a decline on the, uh, of access to the, 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 to the freight railroad due to the, COVID, to, the, due to the restrictions of the COVID-19. But the one of the railroads that was really affected by that was the passenger railroads, especially subways and uh, commuter rails and light rails and everything that actually transport passengers. Um, for example, subway of New York, um, it had uh, before, if I'm not wrong, before COVID-19, they used to transport um, 4 million people per day. It's a lot of people. Uh, during the COVID-19, let's say, peak in New York, they transport maybe less than 10% of that. So maybe 200,000, 300,000. So that was a huge impact on their revenue, a huge impact. Another example was Metro Rio. That's another customer of us. They, they used to transport a million people per day. Today, they're transporting around uh, 380, but they never got, they never hit, like, they never got actually 400 anymore, especially now in Brazil with the situation in the COVID-19. Uh, so, and uh, most of the people is gonna think like, okay, but uh, how we can improve uh, what it can do is just reduce the number of cars, but not for the not not for passengers. For passengers, you cannot reduce the number of cars because we have uh, to increase the space in the, the, the space inside the car. We have to to increase the space in between people inside the car. So we have uh, to maintain the same number of cars, even though the number of passengers have been reduced a lot. So their costs went up, and. Um, and the revenue went down really, really fast. Um, in terms of technology, is um, uh, these railroads they've been investing a lot in ways actually uh, to improve and to to improve actually passenger safety in terms of air conditioning systems to improve their air conditioning systems to make sure that the air in there. I believe that today the air inside actually on a rail car is even better than inside a restaurant, I can tell you. But it's, they've, they've been investing a lot. And actually, that's going to reflect in the future because probably in the future you see better, even better systems. Systems not so crowded. Probably it's going to be crowded in the future, but it's not so, it's now prepared to to let's say uh, face this type of issues. Um, everyone that wants to work with railroad and there is, it, it's a really interesting market. Uh, the, the market is really needs lots of engineering and lots of people that work especially with this type of system. And I can tell you, it's really hard to find. It's a market that is, uh, for most is a uh, small market. For most is a uh, is a really hard market to enter. Uh, so we have a high, let's say, um, walls to enter this market, especially because of the safety. So nobody's gonna buy. For example, I can give an example. I have customers. We sell uh, equipment that is called a uh, uh, train positioning system. We just implemented one now in Pittsburgh. And uh, they, uh, uh, other day I had a call with them and I said, hey, probably you have an idea to put Bluetooth on these, on these uh, equipment for them, for the train positioning system. The first question that I had was, how do I deactivate that? So basically uh, the industry, they wanna see, they wanna see new, let's say new technology, but they cannot leave actually the safety behind. So when you see Bluetooth, they say, okay, but someone might be able to access my reader and then be able to maybe, oh no, I don't want it anymore. So uh, 
at one time, it's not so attractive for, for lots of engineers because it's harder to understand how railroads work and uh, how they think. But once you're there, it's engineers are really in high demand. So um, at least I suggest that I mean, everybody that wants to be part of that, I'm really, uh, I'm going to be really proud of that too. So. But I'm open to questions too. I mean, if you guys have any questions to me, anything about railroads, you can talk about that. Unfortunately, I don't have so much time. Uh, we can talk about railroads, I mean, for one day here. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm, really I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I think I can open for questions. All right, so there's a couple of questions. Um, you had mentioned that there was an increase in freight transportation, possibly during COVID-19. I know there was a lot of like packages and things that had been delayed in other forms of transportation. So do you see this being like a long-term um, mm -hmm. change in the railroad road industry? Okay, railroad industry uh, depends on the location, for example. In, uh, I can give you an example of, uh, let's say Brazil, for example, in Valley. Uh, Valley, that one of the best years for them, Valley, one of the largest mining company in the world. They, they have uh, the largest railroad actually in Brazil. So 70% of the all railroad tracks in Brazil are owned by a private company called Valley, just, just for everyone to know. And uh, they increase their, their investment in railroads and the cargo is starting to increase even more because China is starting to grow again and it starts to demand even more iron ore. So it seems like uh, uh, we're not, uh, railroads, they're not, they're not so, let's say, um, let's say, um, um, uh, affected by the transportation, let's say, of small goods, because normally we see that with the trucks, especially with the uh, small deliveries or, or let's say, uh, closed deliveries. We are directly impacted by transportation of iron ore or, or, um, or have equipment that we have to transport from one side to the other. And due to COVID-19, this didn't change much. We didn't, we was not, I mean, the even though with the, the, the smaller, let's say, with the reduced uh, economy activity in the United States, even though that we still increasing in terms of transportation of a freight railroads. And I see that as a, I see that as a, as a, a trend. I see that as a, as a trend. The railroads actually in the past used to be, we had a decline actually. And a few years ago, we had a, a railroads had a decline because lots of clients actually started to move to, to trucks, with the, especially with the development of the of the rail the roads here in the United States. So lots of the cargo from railroads started to move. Back. What I started to see a few years ago, we started to see that move back to railroads, especially to the, the due to the cost of transportation. Another question that just came in is what is the advantage of using trains instead of trucks to do the goods transportation? Is it related with diesel consumption? Yes, uh, rail, rail uh, in terms of diesel consumption, railroads are four or five times more efficient than trucks. So normally we use trucks. It's like uh, if you take, for example, um, let me take an example. Like uh, um, when you when you we have the big veins in our body. So the tra the railroads are the big veins in our body. However, when you have to go to the top of the fingers, we have to use the small veins. That's why we use the trucks. So trucks are really great for the we cannot beat that. For example, if you transport from rail from from Miami to Fort Lauderdale, it doesn't make any sense. It's better to use the trucks. But when you're talking about transportation from here to Seattle, it's a completely different thing. You're gonna pay 
four times more just to transport by truck. So it depends. It depends. This, the question is a little, I mean, it's a good question, really great question. And, but it depends on how long, uh, how, what is the distance, what is the type of uh, cargo you're going to transport. And, uh, and of course, um, and uh, uh, how fast you want to need that. Another question, um, what is the railroad industry doing to decrease greenhouse gases or pollution? Like, is there certain technologies that are being used? That's a great question, actually. Um, okay, if it depends, depends a lot actually on the on the mark, but on the type of a, a rolling stock. So let's say let's take uh, subways. Subways are, for example, hundred percent electric. They're hundred percent electric. Um, especially most of the commuter trains are electric as well. Um, and uh, they do not emit anything. They're just electric. Uh, when I talk about freight trains, they use a different type of a diesel and they're super efficient. Uh, they burn actually diesel to generate electricity. And then they run, actually they drive electric uh, engine. It's not like a car. It, it's a little bit different because it's like a, it's a mix of uh, diesel and Teslas, something like that. So the most efficient locomotives, they are a mix of that because the electric engine is way more efficient and, and way more powerful than just the mechanical one. So the railway industry is being using, is being actually uh, working a lot on that, especially because diesel consumption represents probably 70% of all the costs of in a railroad transportation. Great. I don't see any other questions that have come in so far, but do you have any other closing remarks or comments that you'd like to make? Um, if anybody has any questions to me, you can send it directly to my email. I'm more than happy to, to answer anything. Uh, I try just to give you an idea about the rail transportation and technology. Of course, we have way more than that. We have uh, all type of systems in railroad, um, especially in freight trains. We have systems, for example, that really improve the, the transportation of these goods. So uh, we have a system today that it didn't have in the past, but it's still, we still have actually, and that's one of the important things we have, we still use technology from let's say 1930s, 1950s sometimes. Now we have, uh, we use, for example, a switch machine. A switch machine is an equipment that moves a train, taking a train from one line to another line. And uh, that's a technology actually designed from 1950s. And you say, oh, that's sold. Uh, yeah, that's sold, but it works. <laughs> and it's safe. It's really safe. So um, most of these railroads, they're like, okay, I don't want to change that because it's safe for us. It, it's reduce our, uh, just to give an idea, one accident that you have, one locomotive that it's cost, let's say $5 million, $10 million, one locomotive. And then when you have a derail, it's a completely mess. You destroy the environment you destroy the, the rolling stock. And uh, the worst part, you block the, the rail tracks and then it can, and the damage can be even more. So again, as I mentioned in the beginning, rail transportation, especially in technology is really interesting. And uh, if you keep safety in mind, you'll be able to do lots of things there. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, and thank you everybody for being here with us this evening. Thanks to Jane from the Brazil Gateway for your work in helping to put this lecture series together. Um, we actually have another lecture next week. I put the registration link in the chat function.
Um, this will be on March 25th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, where our guests will be presenting on sustainability and climate change. Um, but, um, thank you so much, Alex. I really enjoyed your- Thank you very much. Thank, yeah. you. thank you for thank being you here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much.